Good afternoon. You guys having fun? So I think I actually have the biggest challenge of all, which is going after all of these fantastic speakers and challenges, because they've all been so inspiring to me. So uh, my name is David Lang, and I'm with a company called Open ROV. And I want to talk today about science and exploration. But I want to do it in a, maybe a, a different way than you've heard before, because when you think of science, a lot of people, I think of white lab coats and PhDs and researchers, or when they think of exploration, they think of National Geographic explorers going off to far-flung places and sending back photos. I hate those images because I think science and exploration is something that is in all of us and something that we all can do. So I want to tell you my story and some stories of people I know and hopefully you'll agree with me and come along on the challenge. So I need to start at the beginning and that's five years ago. I met this guy named Eric Stackpole, same age as me. And when I met Eric, he told me this crazy story about this underwater cave in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas in Northern California, when there were rumors of lost gold from the gold rush that were thrown to the bottom of this underwater cave. And he'd found this old clipping from a treasure hunting magazine that showed a map of where this cave might be. And Eric was animated. He had characters and talked about treasure hunters who had gone and tried to find this, and no one had been successful. But Eric had this idea that he was going to build an underwater robot to go explore this cave. And I thought, wow, that's really fascinating. And something, I was, at the time, I had a job. I was sitting around writing emails every day, and I knew that I needed some more adventure in my life, and I wanted to be a part of that. There was one big problem, and that was Eric and I didn't know what we were doing. So we didn't know how to build robots like Jessica I am not an engineer, I am not a scientist, um, I don't have any background or training in this. But what we did have was the internet. And so we created this website called openrov.com and we told the world about our idea, our, our hope, our dream to create this underwater robot that could explore this underwater cave. And at the beginning when we created the website, it was just Eric and I going back and forth, basically me asking him questions about physics and buoyancy and all these things that go into making an underwater robot, um, and not too many people. But over time, we steadily got more people who I think just took pity on us and started giving us pointers in the right direction. So before I go on, I want to tell you a little bit about what an ROV is. So an ROV stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle, and it's basically an underwater drone. So it's got a camera, it's got lights so you can see things, it's got uh, thrusters so you can drive it around and you can control it and see what it sees. Our robot can dive to depths of 100 meters. This is uh, a sunken sailboat we found. So eventually, with Eric and my design, we finally got to the point where we could test this thing out at the cave. So we mounted this expedition, meaning we got our friends together and we drove up to this cave, and we found it. And just like the story had said, in the back of the cave, there was this six-foot diameter hole pool of water that just went straight down. You shine a flashlight in it, and it just went down, 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 down. So we put our robots in. We drove it down. It was really an exciting moment. And we didn't find any gold. But, but that's not the end of the story. So we got a lot of attention for doing that. And so much attention that we started getting messages from people all over the world who said, I want a robot like that. And so we put our project on Kickstarter. This was in 2012. And we wanted to raise $20,000 to get our project going and off the ground, and we ended up raising the $20,000 in about two hours, and we ended up raising over $100,000 on Kickstarter, which was really, really exciting for Eric and I, but then we realized, oh my gosh, we've got to make all these things. So we, started, we sent these out as kits, so we sent them out as parts, and then people would build them themselves, and all the boxes started coming into Eric's garage, and it was... I'm not going to lie, it was really intimidating. Um, so we quickly outgrew the garage operation and we were able to ship these things out. And that was in 2000, the end of 2012. And over the past three years, these things have been to 50 countries. Thousands of them have gone out there monitoring infrastructure. They're following divers. They're going into cenotes in Mexico. They're studying penguins in Antarctica. There are sharks in Cuba. They're all over the world. 
So this has gone from just a small garage project. It was just Eric and I working in his garage. I was sleeping in my car and living outside. And to this global community of DIY explorers. That's pretty profound. Um, we're getting videos from all over. We've now got more underwater robots than anybody else. We're one of the largest manufacturers in the world. Um, and it's still growing. This is our latest model, our newest model. This is the Trident. It's actually really cool. It doesn't move like traditional ROVs. It flies more like a fighter jet underwater. You can see this video. It's actually super fast. And it, it's, it's a whole lot of fun to fly. So we've just started manufacturing this. And like Jessica, we're dealing with supply chain, supply chain, supply chain. So that's our problems right now. But OK, that's us. That's our story. And as fun as that is and as cool as that is, there's an even bigger story that I think is more exciting. And that's the broader trend of technology for science and exploration becoming more accessible and more powerful. This is our neighbor in, in Oakland. This is Chris Anderson. So f six years ago, Chris, this is a photo from when he was flying an RC plane in the backyard with his kids and had the idea, what, what if I took these Lego Mindstorms and added it to this RC plane? I wonder if we could create an autopilot for this. And so Chris started playing around with this with his kids. He created a website just like we did. He called it DIYdrones.com and started asking people, hey, can we create a low-cost autopilot for these RC components? Because all of a sudden, all of these, the computing power that goes into your cell phones is accessible building blocks for makers to toy with. So that has now grown into North America's largest drone manufacturer. And these drones are being used for everything from monitoring wildlife to mapping, um, mapping lands. And it's amazing what these drones are being used for, especially in terms of science and exploration. So if this garage looks familiar, it's actually the same garage that Eric and I started in. This is, these are his roommates. And they had this crazy idea. They wondered if they could use these cell phone components to build satellites. And they started prototyping. and different designs. They used this standard called a CubeSat standard. And they took some, some pretty powerful cameras and computing power, and they created their own satellite. And their goal was to launch hundreds of these things and able to, that are able to get an image of every location on Earth every day. And they started a company, and they built all these satellites, and they launched all these satellites, and they're doing that now. They're getting an image from every location on Earth every day. They started in the same garage as we did. It's really exciting what's possible right now. They caught a wildfire as it was just getting started. So I told you about the drones. The drones are being used to monitor wildfires in Indonesia. There's another group that I, that I found out about that built a 50-cent origami microscope. It's called the Foldscope. So basically, it's a piece of paper you fold it up, and it works as a powerful microscope, and it only costs 50 cents. So people are using this all over the world. You know, this, is a, this makes the tool very accessible. And you can go to their, their website. is called Microcosmos. It's the community webso website for Foldscope. And the community there, these are not professional scientists. Some of them are. But a lot of them are just people who have really fascinating questions. And I think there's this trend of putting tools in the hands of people and seeing what questions they have, and then l allowing them to really follow those curiosities and those questions. Another group was after the, the Fukushima nuclear reactor meltdown in, in Japan, a group got together and said, wow, we don't know what's happening with our environment right now. So they built their own DIY Geiger counters and began driving all over Japan and out into the ocean and trying to sense what the radioactivity levels were in and around their, their areas. And they have now created this, this global community and the largest data set of, of radioactivity in the world. And this was just a group of people that got together and said, what's going on in our community? There's all sorts of innovation and development happening in terms of DIY lab equipment, so low-cost biotech tools. Um, I know, I think there's one in Chicago, but I know in New York, in San Francisco, and in LA, and all these places, there are these community bio labs where even if you don't have a PhD in biology, you can go there and learn and take classes and begin to do experiments. So it's not just us. You know, we were not just an anomaly. We're actually part 
of this much bigger trend. And so great, there's all these low cost tools, but what does that mean? Well, it means a lot for science because this means that all of a sudden the barriers to asking questions are much lower. And so there's this whole new trend of citizen science, people who aren't necessarily professional scientists rising up, networking together, online, using their mobile devices, and pooling and collecting their data, working with professionals, and actually doing real and important scientific research. So this is one story from our community. This is Laura James. Laura is a, a diver and uh, also starts, started building underwater robots. She lives in, in Puget Sound, and she became very concerned when she was diving and driving robots and started seeing that sea stars, starfish, uh, in her area were just starting to die off, like they really were struggling and not doing well. And so she alerted scientists. And scientists looked into it and they confirmed that, yeah, this is a big problem. And it turns out that up and down the West Coast, sea stars were dying. And so it's called sea star wasting syndrome. And nobody knew what was causing it. And so Laura and got more people involved. She decided to start a citizen science project called Six Starfish. So she invited anybody and everybody, if you're diving or driving robots or just walking up and down the, the shore and come across a tide pool, to snap a photo on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter and hashtag Six Sea Star. And all of that data that they collected then got put into the research that they were doing at UC Santa Cruz and was used to actually help figure out what was going on. It turns out that it was a virus and that it was linked to, um, it was linked to, to warming oceans. But the, the important thing, and it's, it's really tragic, but the important thing and the exciting thing for me is looking at what Laura did. She just instigated this community of people to care about an issue. And this is going on in their own backyard. And so the coverage of this, this whole event changed. The media coverage was not just about, oh, there's six sea stars. It was, yeah, there's six sea stars, but there's a way to get involved. You can participate in this study. You can help us discover what's going on. And now that, that community monitoring has translated. It's now going on with sea urchins. They're trying to figure out which starfish are more affected or less affected. They're still helping. They're involved. The scientific method actually becomes the message. You know, it's not just a news headline you see where it's like starfish are dying. It's here's how you can actually play a part. I want to bring that actually closer to home. Does, does everybody know what's going on in Flint right now? I mean, it's, it's a disaster. Uh, the lead levels there are unacceptable. And I don't, I'm not even going to go into the, the problems of, of what, they do, what has happened. But I do want to point out an aspect of the story that you may not be aware of. So th this is a, a situation of institutional failure. The people who were supposed to be monitoring these situations did not do a good job. And the way that they actually figured out and proved that these lead levels were too high, it was a citizen science effort. So a, a professor at Virginia Tech got together with the community and said, you guys need to do this yourselves. And so they were the ones who used these new cheap and affordable sensors to measure what was happening. And they said, you know, this is unacceptable. And now you see this media coverage. It's, it's a community that's transformed, that's not reacting to science. It's using science to tell a story. And so that is my challenge to you. I want you to illuminate the unknown in your community. And that can be in the natural world, or that can be in the built environment, or that can be with some social issues that are going on. But use citizen science to share that discovery with the world. I want you guys to be curious. I want you guys to ask questions because I think you will surprise yourselves and I think you could surprise the whole world with what you discover. Thank you. Great. Yeah. You did awesome. All right, so I'm kind of tired of doing my job and I would love for someone else to come and fill in for me. We're here in the, the tie. Um, and then we have our designated mic runner. He's here permanently, but who else would like to be a mic runner? Me. But you need to nominate somebody that was sleeping. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Who was? Who was sleeping? You? You? You were asleep? You look like you're awake. You were asleep. Come up here. Sleeping? Yes. Oh, man. 
They were. They didn't appreciate <laughs> the underwater drones far. I thought enough. I had good images. I don't know. <laughs> the microphone's over there. That's true. Maybe you can run over and get it from her. All right. So you have your time here. Got it. And um, it's this is your show. Okay. Who has questions? A you with the fluffy hair and a beard. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm Dylan. Um, I actually had a question about the uh, the the rover. Um, so there's a uh, cord that's attached to the rover, right? Yep. Um, is that like a cord that like a rope that kind of like follows the rover and like limits how far it can go, or is that like actually um, a cord that like sends information back through? Um, that's a great question. And can I tell you something else? That's always the first question is, what is what's that wire for? Um, and so I apologize that I didn't bring it up in the presentation. But the tether is so we can get live video back to the surface, so you can actually control it and see what it sees. Because radio waves don't travel as well through water. So it's not quite like a drone where you can just send it off and see the video. If you want to see live video, you need the tether. But if you want to program it to do some autonomous mission, you could do that too. Um, and then my other question was, like, how far, what's, like, what's the length of the cord? That's a good question. So it goes down. So the, the ROV can go down to 100 meters of depth. We are developing a, a tether that can go out uh, 300 meters. That's what the protocol can do. So it can go further along than it can go deep. Good questions. OK, first, you in the back with your hand raised far back. And then I'll, I'll get someone at the Limblum table. OK, so I'm Destiny from Phoenix. Oh, that's pretty loud. Okay. <clears throat> so my, <laughs> my question was, okay, so you have a cord connecting to the underwater thing. What if, <laughs> sorry, what if, like, an animal swims through it, gets connected, and, like, chokes itself? So we just pretty much killed an animal. Duh. So how would we prevent that from happening? You can't get live footage through, like... Like, you know, something else? Because that would hurt the sea animals. So not, uh, That's a good question. So, um, or you could get it, you know, it could get tangled on coral. or there, That's a really good question. Um, and, and I think what's great about this is it's specifically designed to be neutrally buoyant. So it really stays fairly stable in the water. We've never had a problem with an animal getting caught. Um, on the flip side, we've actually have people who go out and rescue whales. So when humpback whales get stuck in crab traps or whatever, they actually use these devices to go out and see what the issue is. So we've actually seen the opposite problem. Or I guess we've actually seen it to solve that problem. That's a good question. Can you get a mic down there? Hi, I'm Ella Montgomery from Limbloom Math and Science Academy. Hey. And I really wanted to know what your driving force was during your prototyping and your designing of your uh, model. So what made you want to continue? That's such a great question. And this is something that I wish Jessica would have talked more about. Because you should see our, you, if, you, if you guys ever come to Oakland and you want to come see our robot factory, just email me and let me know. And we have a wall of prototypes that never worked. There were, you know, 20, 100 of these things that we designed before we ever got one to actually work. And what Eric and I always said was, we're going to keep doing this because we're having fun. We liked working with each other. We always wanted to make the process as exciting as the end, as the end product. We call it maximizing our return on adventure. And um, I think if you're working with people that you like, and it's interesting, and especially if there's an end goal where you, you know, there's some payoff that you can, like for us it was the, uh, the treasure, it, it'll keep you going. And also if you're asking people for help, if you're open about what you're doing, you'll find that having people come and give you feedback or pointers in new directions is really energizing. It kind of keeps you going and sends you in new directions. But were there times where I thought this thing was a total failure and we were never, never going to go on? Absolutely. But we somehow kept doing it. OK, I saw a hand at Chicago Military. I think I see one in the back. So military first. And then the other Mike Runner can run to the table right by the camera. Uh, 
Um, my name is Jose Landaverde from Chicago Military Academy. Um, do you have versions of the drone that could have mods on it, like extra, you know, arms to pick up stuff or microphones to pick up sound waves or something through the water? Yeah, that's a great question. So our project has always been open source. So we've encouraged people. We, it, it's not like we, we say, don't open this or don't mod with it. We encourage people to do that. So if you go on to openrov.com and you click on the forums, you can actually see all the ways that people are modifying their ROVs. And I've seen them in all shapes and sizes. People have made big ones and small ones. People have added, I, a few people have worked on adding hydrophones to, to listen to sounds. People are adding different sensors. People are adding grabber arms to pick things up. Um, absolutely. That's what the whole project is all about. We encourage our community to add value in that way. Thanks for the question. It's great. Remember the school in the back. Do we have any questions on this side of the room before I move the mic? Okay, I see you. Um, I would have a question just like with Jessica with the socket. How can people like get influenced or encouraged by your inventions like can they take it apart and create something better or you know expand on it to help benefit you and them as a whole the, yeah yeah absolutely that's a great question i think that kind of builds off of the last one in that we think about that a lot actually because when we got started these devices i mean the Underwater robots are actually not new. They've been around for 20 years. They just cost $100,000. And so for us, we never had access to these tools. And we always thought that was such a bummer. And so we used off-the-shelf tools. We used things like Arduino, which is an open source microcontroller. Um, we used 3D printers and other people's tools. And pe we were able to stand on the shoulders of giants. And we think often about who's going to be able to invent or what people are going to be able to do with this tool. So we always think about it as a tool, and we are very curious and excited uh, and supportive of who's going to come behind us and who's going to build on top of what we've done. Dan. It's a good question. Aside Thanks. from the dab, are people okay. right now? There was a hand over at that table. Just, yes, please stand up. Hi, my name is Ariel. I'm from Kenwood. I have a question about you, or if you know this with any of the other drone projects, if you've ever had an issue concerning privacy and the use of data that you guys collect. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the drone, the drone projects that I know of, there are a ton of privacy concerns. There are a ton of safety concerns with flying drones. Um, and I'm sure you guys have seen all of those in the news, right? I mean, these are headlines where you know, drones get in the way of, of helicopters trying to put out forest fires or whatever, whatever the case may be, privacy. Um, Underwater, it's not so much a privacy issue. I mean, the, you know, there's a few fish who maybe didn't want to be bothered, but um, it's, that's less of an issue. I think the, the, the concern and the question that we get and where we love the dialogue is, well, what if you're going to be screwing up a reef? Or what if you're going to you know, influence that habitat? That's something we're really conscious about and thinking about um, and trying to create community norms around. But... Um, Privacy is, n is less of a, is less of a, less of a, but that's a, a great question. Okay, I saw a couple of hands at Chaz. Chicago, I one, okay. Right behind you. Yeah, hi, Jake Doyle again from Chaz. And uh, I was just wondering, what do you think, um, like, let's say that we wanted to maybe use some of your drones or some of other people's drones, like, to do this challenge. Um, and maybe we had struggles getting our hands on these in order to do these challenges. Do you think that you would be able to help us in any way on, like, getting the resources to use these or yep. um, things that we needed for that? Absolutely. So I have a, I, I, yes. If you guys want to do a challenge underwater and you want to build an underwater drone to do it, I will make that happen. Or if, or if, like, do you have any way that, like, if we wanted to do something that wasn't just underwater, like something in the air or on land, do you, would you have I, any connections will, to uh, land-based yeah. or air-based drones for that? Uh, I do, and I will, yes. And so, okay, can I give out my email address? Definitely good to know. Okay, my email is david at openrov.com. And if you, you. Got, if you guys decide to do this challenge and you have any questions 
about any of the Come technical up. stuff, I'm really excited to, to help you connect with the, the resources and the tools that will work. I'm excited about that. Thank you. OK, I saw a hand at, forgive me if I butchered this, Edmondson, the blonde with the glasses. And then I'm going to get Bogan. We've still got five minutes, so we can get, we can get a few more. Hi, I'm Natalia from Amundsen, and my question is, relating to the drones, you told us that they are used to monitor wildlife. My question to you is, to what extent do the drones monitor? Do they disturb hunting and other activities? Oh, that's a good question. And can I tell you guys something else? Roald Amundsen is my favorite explorer of all time. He was the Norwegian guy who was the first one to get to the North Pole. If you don't know about him or you don't know about the great um, age of Antarctic exploration, you should read about him because it's, it's a really fascinating story of how he, was, he and another group were racing to get to the South Pole. Anyways, um, as far as wildlife monitoring, you know something interesting we found? Does anybody, this, does anybody here scuba dive or anything like that? So when you scuba dive, like fish run away from you. They're very scared of you. But what we found is that they're very curious about the robot. They swim up to it and look in the, in the window, and it's, it's pretty exciting. And so we think this is kind of a unique opportunity to actually maybe even see more and learn more about wildlife in ways that, that we haven't been able to do with scuba diving. OK, I saw a hand at Bogan. Please stand up. doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi. My name is Ann Jacquez, and I have a question. Yeah. My question is about safety and regulations, right? Yep. So um, is this product safe for anybody every ages? Because I know most products, they have a age range. So like, what are the age range? Like, can anybody use it and stuff? Yeah. So the age, we, we typically say for our underwater robot that if you want to build it, high school is, is great. There are okay. high schools all over. We work with a lot in Oakland with high schools who are building them. And um, it's, it's doable for, for that age for sure. OK, so kids under eight years old cannot use it and stuff? Our robot probably, unless you have someone building it with you, I would say wait okay. until the next version. OK, thank you. That's a good question. Thanks. Hi, I'm from, uh, I'm Caesar from Infinity High School. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, uh, the uh, first, like the first time you started building it, how many uh, prototypes? Prototypes you had to go through, yeah. So for, for perfecting. Yeah, it's a good question. I was just re listening to a, a recording of when we went to that cave, and we were, t we actually said this was the 21st prototype that we had, that we fought that. 20 before it started to work, basically. So quite a few. And it's funny because I have this really vivid memory of the first time we ever tested one of these in the pool. And, and it's kind of going back to your question about um, did, did it ever seem like we wouldn't get... And it sank. Like, it, as soon as we put it in, it just flooded and it just sank to the bottom of the pool. And I was so heartbroken because we put all this effort in. And I don't know if you guys watched that video of the fixed mindset for, versus the growth mindset, but I was so sad and, about the robot, but my teammate, Eric, was so excited. He's like, David, look at all the stuff we just learned. He's like, this didn't work, and this didn't work, but this did, and, and I just realized at that moment that if you're going to build these things, you've got to embrace failure. You know, you've got to take every one of those opportunities and figure out what you did learn, and then go on to building the next one. So lot, it took us a long time. One more. We have time for one more. Hi, I'm Josh from Northside, and I was just wondering, I had a quick first question. Um, there's a picture of the, I think it was a sailboat that had sunk to the bottom, yeah. um, and in the picture was the ROV, so I was just wondering, like, who took that picture? Like, what took that? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> was it two ROVs? <laughs> we, yeah, we've definitely had two ROVs in the water, but that one was taken in Lake Tahoe. And I am actually pretty sure that a diver took that. You know what happened is we went down. We were just going in Lake Tahoe, just testing the robot. And we didn't even know the scuba divers were down there. And we, and we came across them. And I think they were just as surprised to see us. And I think they snapped that photo, actually. 
And um, I was also wondering, so what you're planning to do in the future with the um, ROV that you created, and also what you might be looking into for the future in terms of other um, different technologies that you were looking into making. Yeah, so in the future, um, you know, it's funny, because when Eric and I first met, and he told me that story of underwater treasure and all this stuff, we sat around for three hours, and we had this conversation that was about our lives and what our hopes and dreams were, and we said, wouldn't it be cool if there were 10,000 of these things all over the world and you could just log into your computer and drive one anywhere around the world? And so right now we're working on live internet control. So you guys could just pull up your phones and be controlling and driving a robot that's halfway around the world in Fiji or Bermuda, exploring right from where you're sitting. And that is our vision. And we're actually dangerously close to getting to that initial dream that we had. So uh, I, I always tell people, be careful with your dreams because you never know. You never know. You might get there. All right, let's give our presenter a round of applause. Thank Thanks. Good job.